Thank you very, very much, everybody, for coming um, to this, the uh, opening session of the uh, Festival of Dangerous Ideas for Dangerous <coughs> Times. Um, and I'm really uh, excited to, to be here chairing this, the, uh, the very first session. Um, sorry, I should say, first of all, my name is Kate Connolly. Um, I'm a member of Counterfire, one of the organisations that's helped put this festival on. Um, and I'm very excited to introduce today um, Terry Eagleton, who is a leading uh, Marxist literary critic in Britain and also an excellent writer. And I would definitely recommend um, his new book, Why Marx Was Right, um, which is a very um, interesting and very accessible um, introduction to the ideas of Karl Marx. Um, Terry Eagleton is going to speak for about 40 minutes. Um, and then we're going to hand over for questions and comments and discussion from the audience. Um, and then Terry Eagleton is going to um, sum up at the, uh, at the end. So um, thank you very much for coming. I hope you all enjoy the festival. First of all, my voice doesn't carry that far, so I don't know whether it will be okay at the back. I hope it will. There's no mic, I'm afraid. Um, secondly, I, I have to dash off and give another talk right after this one, and I've just come hot foot from another. Uh, so either I'm going to, if I collapse, just carry on as if <laughs> nothing has happened, you know, and try, try and ignore it. But the point of that being that um, I haven't got that much time. I'll try and leave as much time for discussion as I can. But the session might have to be shorter you know, than these sessions normally are. I did. Um, I did indeed produce this uh, remarkably cheap and extraordinarily attractive <laughs> <laughs> couple of years ago. I read a little to myself every night, <laughs> marvelling at the lucidity of its language, <laughs> the acuteness of its insights, the eloquence of its prose. You too can share this delirious experience for a very small fee. Um, it was, however, a slight embarrassment when the book first appeared couple of years ago, because um, for a brief uh, euphoric moment, it was something like number eight on the list of Amazon best-selling business books. <laughs> what a backhanded compliment. I was really embarrassing. I mean, when chief executive officers start taking their ideas from me, we're really in trouble. You know? <laughs> uh, why? I, and I asked myself why that was. It wasn't so much, I think, that this, of course, was when capitalism had just hit a uh, dramatic crisis. I don't think it was so much that capitalists were interested in Marx, or, they, or rather they were interested in Marx insofar as he might tell them something about capitalism and what might be wrong with it or how to run it properly. Um, in other words, it was, the, it was the, the very significant point, which you don't very get, up, get very often, when capitalists suddenly began talking about capitalism. Notice that a few years ago? Mm -hmm. That's very bad for them. They shouldn't do that. We should you know, write them a letter telling them, you know, for their own good, <laughs> to stop doing that. They talk about, you know, liberal democracy or the free society or market society. But of course, to start naming themselves, as it were, historically, politically, in the way that Marx did, is to, fall, is to play his game. To give a name to, to themselves and to their system is, for one thing, of course, to confess that there can be other systems. Systems survive, among other things, by not having perceivable limits to them, yes? Just seeming to be the invisible color of daily life themselves. Systems also survive by not seeming to have any origins, yes? They always were, yes? Because that which was born can die. So you don't want to admit origin. You don't want to admit, as Mark shows us, that this particular system arose in a particular historical way and, of course, could, could easily, easily fade from, from human history. Um, fixing, identifying the limits of the system is part, I think, is one of Marx's great achievements, giving a name to what otherwise seems just everyday existence. Yes, objectifying, estranging, fixing, identifying, delimiting this as a specific and questionable <coughs> way of life, powered by certain dynamics that could be changed and so on. In a strange sense, what he does there is akin to what a, a crisis of capitalism does. That's why they were buying 
because of crisis of capitalism also. Crisis is bad for capitalism, not for the, just for the obvious reasons, but because it does actually, as it were, tend to estrange it and make it conscious of itself as a specific system. You know, it tends to show it up in that way, and that, that is not really, that's not really very good for the system itself. Um, Many of what people think of as Marx's as ideas original to Marx are not actually. I mean, how you know whether that plunges you into an inconsolable grief depends on how highly you rate the concept of originality. You know, maybe romantics overrate the concept of originality. There's something to be said for it. By the way, most of his ideas are not original. Yes. I've been given special permission by the organizers to say things like this. <laughs> 30 years ago, they took you out and shot you. <laughs> um, revolution, sorry, I mean, revolution, in a sense, ushers in modern thought with the French Revolution. It ushers in the modern age. Communism, very ancient idea. Um, class, well, uh, Marx and Engels themselves said that social class was none of their invention. Social class was known long before they, they came to write. Um, uh, the primacy of the economic, the um, importance of the economic, the foundational force of economic, no, not really. I mean, Freud, who was no friend of Marxism, believed that the economic was the primary motivation of human society, and that without the urge to labor, without the necessity to labor, uh, we would all, indolent creatures that we were, simply lie around the place all day in various interesting postures of erotic enjoyment. <laughs> and it was actually the pleasure principle. Um, and it was only this reality principle, as he calls it, which made, meant we couldn't do that all the time, or at least only a small number of people called aristocrats or whatever they do that, yes. Um, the idea of history as a succession of modes of production not original to Marx. You can find it in the radical enlightenment, particularly for some odd reason, in the Scottish enlightenment. The Scottish enlightenment are keen on that. And there is a doctrine, there is a doctrine, specific, I think, peculiar and specific to Marx, um, uh, which if you approach me later for a very modest fee, I will tell you about We are you know away all of these ideas that <laughs> <laughs> come along. You know. um, it's, yeah, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, it, it, meanwhile, with, with surreal speed, since I have to get through this, I think, um, let me just, uh, just uh, take a look, look at some of the words, shibboleths, you know, um, sacred cows, uh, stereotypes, idea of, of what Marx's ideas were. And how Marx has been, of course, of all modern thinkers, far more uh, travesty, stereotyped, disfigured than almost any other, but even than Freud, actually, because there's more, I suppose, there's more politically in it in the case of Marx. It is absolutely extraordinary how people think they know what he said and don't. Um, the state, for example. Right? I mean, many of us know that Marx was even more hostile to the state than the Tea Party is. If for rather more discreditable you know, reason. Uh, but how widely, how widely is that known? The notion, forgetting that Marx is, has a passionate concern for the individual. That Marx is, a, Marx is a very strange and rather potent combination of, uh, of, of um, a radical romantic and an enlightenment rationalist. That's quite a smart combination, actually. It's actually hard to beat in many ways. But as far as being a, being a radical romantic goes, Marx, in the great radical romantic tradition, believed um, in a society in which the powers and capacities, a phrase he uses almost like a mantra, the powers and capacities of individual men and women could be most freely and richly developed. That, if you like, is not only Marx's politics, but his ethics. Actually, he pinches quite a bit of that from Hegel and even, even from Aristotle, Marx is a kind of closet, Aristotelian. You know. But that idea that the epitome of human good, whether ethically or politically, consists in the individual, in the concrete individual, being freely able to re realize his or her powers 
in a rich, all-round, emancipated way, um, is a staple doctrine of the radical romantic tradition. And Marx is right in the middle of that. Um, he's actually very wary of theory. You know, this enormously important theorist who transfigured the world is quite wary of abstract ideas, not in the kind of Philistine way that some so-called Marxists did, you know. You know, while we're talking here, comrades, people are dying out there, so let's shut up, you know, that kind of thing, which you might have heard a bit of. You know. <coughs> not in that way, Marx of course understood that theory was integral to practice, but he thought that the abstract was simple and that the concrete was complex. Uh, we normally think of it the other way around, don't we? The concrete is, you know, what you can handle, it's palpable, it's tangible. But Marx thought differently. He thought the abstract was necessary, but it was more simple than the concrete, and you used the abstract to, as it were, build up to the rich complexity of the concrete. There was a kind of interaction between them. As far as individuals went, as I say, he believed that they should be free to realize their powers and capacities. That's a very attractive idea. It's also quite a problematical one. All their powers and capacities. What if you have an irresistible urge to murder the person next door? You know? How do you realize that as well? Does it, they, is Marx being a naive libertarian about that, for example? Question worth asking. But also, the question he did, he did know how to answer, I think, although, again, he's pinching from Hegel. Um, but if everybody has to realize their powers and capacities, do they do it in isolation, which is a liberal idea of society, or, or you know, what's, what's the difference that socialism makes there? And Marx's answer to that, again, lifted shamelessly from Hegel, is um, you have to have a kind of society in which individuals can realize their selves in and through the self-realization of others. That's the, dis the distinction, the key difference between liberalism and socialism. So, socialism is just whatever set of material institutions would allow <coughs> as fully and feasibly as possible. Uh, or as Marx puts it in, in the Communist Manifesto, uh, the free development of each is the condition of the free development of all. There's an exclusive amount of ethics and politics uh, contained in that. And if you think of that at a, at a personal level, at an interpersonal level, the church in which one individual's uh, self-realization uh, happens and can happen only in and through and in terms of the self-realization of another individual, then the technical term for that is love. Right? That is love. Love is the rest of reciprocal self-development of two or more individuals and what we have here I know Marxists aren't supposed to talk about love it's kind of mushy and so on but what we have here is a concept that has been called political love what would be the political equivalent you know apart from all you know going around hugging everybody all the time you know, what would be the political equivalent of that situation and one of Marx's very down to earth and mundane answers to that is the cooperative the cooperative, which seems to be the key unit of his thought of a social society, because in a cooperative, the self-development of each and in terms of the others is simply built into the nature of the situation. It's not some striving, it's not some, as it were, strenuous moral effort. It's part of what a cooperative actually is. All right. Um, you know, yes. Um, the primacy of the economic, this, this down-at-heel Jew who once wrote that nobody had ever written so much about money and had so little, um, <laughs> labored away at this fruitless business, you know, tedious business of economics, um, in order to diminish the tyranny of the economic over men and women. That is the enormous paradox, not as an end in itself. He wanted to write his big book on Balzac, which he never, he never got round to writing, yeah? And Marx's idea, when, while, when Marx, why was Marx so interested in people like Balzac and so on? Because when Marx came to talk about production, what he took as a paradigm of production was not cotton mills or coal mines, it was art. Why? Because art seemed to him to be a paradigm of the kind of production that's done, to use a technical theological term, just for the hell of it. 
In other words, art, I'm just sort of in its most radical way, and it was joined in this, of course, by William Blake and William Morris and many other in the radical romantic tradition, art was, was itself a critique of the kind of society in which you would only do something for some reason beyond it, for power or for profit or for utility, yes? Art was an example of energies exercised purely for their own self-delight. And therefore, it's not surprising that Marx was a kind of aesthete as well as a socialist. And those two were very closely linked in his thought as, as they were in the work of the great aesthete and socialist Oscar Wilde was remembered you know, by the English as, as an art for art's sake person, but of course, as we know, wrote a magnificent pamphlet on socialism, which was very influential in the English socialist movement. I once wrote a remarkably uh, brilliant play about Oscar Wilde, and, <laughs> and we'll be performing from it in Hay on Y and tomorrow at 5 o'clock, so if anybody likes to come with me you know, down to Wales tomorrow, a form of the audience and so forth. Um, <coughs> Wilde certainly saw, as Marx saw, that the point of life was not labor, but leisure. The question was, how could you use the largely fruitless labor that men and women had endured in class society? How could you use the fabulous accumulation of material and spiritual and cultural wealth in a way that would then allow for the most feasible amount of freedom from the curse of toil? Yeah? How, how, as far as Wilde was concerned, could one create a society in which one people would just lie around all the day, you know, in loose crimson garments, <laughs> and sipping absinthe, reciting Homer to one another? You know, and that would just be the working day, you know. What I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, and astonishingly, scandalously, Marx says, we can do it. Why? Because of those kind people called the bourgeoisie because of that kind history called capitalism, which stored up the most extraordinary and formidable amount of human spiritual, cultural, material riches. And what happens under capitalism? People still work as hard, at least, if not harder, than our Neolithic ancestors did. We happen to know how hard our Neolithic ancestors did. And we certainly work harder, or at least the Americans do. Yeah. <laughs> The question was, how could we use that? You know, not to reject that in some ascetic kind of, you know, some sniffy way. How could we use that uh, for the benefit of all? How could we put that at the disposal of all? That, of course, is simply, is simply the question of social, socialism. But notice, notice what praise, what deeply generous-minded praise that Marx has for his old antagonist, the bourgeoisie. Anybody who comes across somebody who says, I'm a Marxist and I hate the bourgeoisie, sorry, they're not. They might be some other kind of people. They're not thinking dialectically. They're not seeing, as Marx saw, that the history of, of the middle classes was the most revolutionary history that we've ever seen. In an in astonishingly brief time, it wiped the ancien regimes from the face of the earth. There were a few things it left over, like, you know, <coughs> Prince Charles, or on earth you could overlook him with ears like that, it's hard to understand, but nevertheless it did. Um, and, and not only swept all that away, but laid the basis for human rights, for feminism, for democracy, uh, for an enormous accumulation of material goods, a massive coupled empires, freed slaves, and so on. How could you possibly say that that history is just to be written off in some Philistine left? On the contrary, Marx saw it was a matter of using it, but he also saw it was a history simultaneously of emancipation and enslavement, and that those two things were as close as the two sides of the sheet of paper. Yes, Marx opposed the Jeremiahs, who said history had been nothing but torture and nightmare, as just as he opposed the starry-eyed progressives of his day, who said everything was getting better. History was a nightmare weighing on the brains of the living, but it could also be used if you could sort of handle it in the right kind of way. Okay, so he was, yeah. um, very quickly, um, Marx was a kind of prophet, you know, in a sense. Not, not a prophet in the caricatured and actually mistaken sense of a clairvoyant, 
In fact, most of Marx's predictions were wrong. Marx was terrible at predicting. Uh, his, his mother wasn't. His mother was a far finer clairvoyant than do Very few people know about this. So this is my one original contribution to Marx. <laughs> <laughs> Marx's mum was a clairvoyant. She was, actually. She foresaw the very hour of her own death from 30 years off or something. Maybe, you know, Marx took that over in thinking that he could tell when, you know, what would happen to capitalism. But generally speaking, generally speaking, he wasn't that kind of prophet. He was a prophet in the Old Testament sense, um, not of um, peering into the future, but of saying, unless we change our ways, there's not going to be a future, or it's not going to be very pleasant. Prophet in the Old Testament, Jewish prophet, of which Marx is, among other things, a secular, late modern version, denounces the injustices of the present, uh, not in the name of some fancy blueprint of society, because you can't pre-draft freedom. That's one reason why Marx is not utopian, why he's so silent deliberately about the nature of the future. The, the Jews, the pious Jews, were sworn to silence. They couldn't make graven images of the future. Yes, because to make graven images of the future was to try and manipulate and control the future, to have it in your pocket. Yes. Marx is a secular version of that, but he sees that the only image of the future is the failure of the present. If you want to see the outline of the future, th there's a negative profile of it in the contradictions and intolerable injustices of the present. Only by unlocking those could you start anything interesting. Yes? But you can't, pre as I say, pre-draft, you can't blueprint what would then happen, because then the future would be a mere extrapolation from the present. Yes? And unless it goes beyond the logic, it won't, it won't genuinely be a future as opposed to the postmodernists who said the future will be like the present with more options. <laughs> um, the only historic thing for Marx, in a very curious sense of Marx, another astonishing feature is that nothing historic that has yet really happened. We're not even in history. He won't even dignify the tale of wretchedness and hard labor and misery that has been human history today. He won't even embrace that with the title of history. He calls it pre-history. And the only historic thing to do would be to break with that nightmare and to get something else off the ground. But how that would shape itself is properly wary of being too articulate about it. Um, how would you? Uh, going to house in 15 minutes. Okay. Um, uh, yes, all right. Just one a couple of other um, misconceptions about the market, I think. Um, you know, that the, the supposedly non-democratic or authoritarian nature of socialism. It's very understandable that that should be so, isn't it? People should feel that, given the monstrous legacy of Stalinism, you know, that made a brilliant idea stink in the nostrils of millions of people who might profit in some way. Profit. And we are still having to handle that difficult legacy, yes? Um, you know, um, nonetheless, we just, I suppose, have to point out that as far as Marx's own thought goes, the phrase socialist democracy, which some people bandy about, is a kind of tautology. You know, how could there, for him, be a form of socialism who was not democratic? So socialism is exactly the carrying of democracy into areas of human life, domestic, or economic, or whatever, previously sealed, sealed off, about a revolution in the very idea the political itself. Not a change of political personnel, not simply a change of political institutions, a change in the very perception of the political. And there, in a sense, Marx genuinely is a kind of visionary. But socialist, socialist democracy is a tautology in the same sense that, um, say, business ethics is an oxymoron. <laughs> <laughs> We used to talk about it. We used to be military intelligence, but that took something of a cliche. We <coughs> personally invented a new one. I hope you certainly did that. Um, the proletariat. A lot of misunderstandings about that either. Um, you know, Marx worked. Marx worked and lived in a society in Victorian England where he knew perfectly well that the vast, number, the vast majority of proletariat were domestic workers. And that meant women. 
Yes? He knew perfectly well that the proletariat in the more narrow and technical sense of the blue-collar worker, you know, who indeed has suffered some kind of a diminution in the evolution of the Marx never thought that the proletariat in that sense was identical with the working class. He thought that that kind of worker, because of his or her cooperative uh, conditions, had a very important part to play, of course, in social change. But Marx knew that it was the skivvies and the cooks and the footmen and the, and the kitchen maids. Yeah. He knew very well that that was the, uh, the reality of the working class in his own, in his own society. The proletariat was a woman. The proletariat began as a woman. Proles means children. Proles is the ancient Latin word for children, and it means those progeny, progeny, right? It means those people who were, the, who were too poor to serve the state with any, by anything but producing labor power in the form of children. Proletariat yeah? begins in that sense, as a word. Um, whatever other, whatever defects there may be in Marx, and there are quite a few, he is astonishingly um, in advance of his time when it comes to nature and ecology and the environment. There is indeed, as his critics have been quick to point out, a kind of Promethean strain in Marx, an enlightenment notion of man dominating nature. Uh, you know, and, and again, we, we mustn't overreact to that you know, unless we build some dikes pretty quickly and dominate nature. We're going to lose Bangladesh, yes? Unless we develop vaccines and dominate nature, a lot of people are going to die. So let's not have some, as it were, excessive romantic or sentimentalist reaction to that Promethean strain. Nevertheless, it's, it's astonishing, I think, how when Marx talks about nature, he always, and Engels too, um, despite the fact that he liked to hunt with a Cheshire hunt, which is a bit embarrassing. Um, uh, Literally dominate nature. The, uh, they always speak in terms of a kind of symbiosis or some kind of friendly relationship, some different kind of relationship between humanity and nature, um, some sort of dialogue between them. Um, uh, now, I just, I'll finish that by saying that, of course, I mentioned that he had one or two faults. I've been given a special permission to talk about these. I have a certificate in my background. <laughs> yes. The leadership tells me it's all right, within moderation. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's nothing, nothing all that new. It's like, you know, startling revelations. He was, a, you know, uh, he was an old patriarch who was foolishly snobbish about his wife's aristocratic status. He was, uh, he could be at least, um, he, he, could, he could talk like a pure 19th century card-carrying determinist. At times he talks like a determinist, but there's an extraordinarily subtle chapter in my book, which I read every night, marvel its dialectical skill, in which I try to sort out you know, where, what, where Marx is a determinist or where he's not, or what the relationship between the other two are. Actually, when Marx, when Marx talks in the Communist Manifesto about the, the downfall of capitalism and the triumph of socialism being alike assured, you know, straight bit of down the line determinism, if you like, uh, I, I think he's wrong about that. I think many of us do. But he's wrong for interesting reasons. He doesn't think they're assured because of there are laws written into the cosmic process or the historical process, as it were, copper plate and guarantee the advent of socialism. He thinks that the contradictions of, of capitalism are such it's bound to fail in the end. And he also thinks that that being the case, it would be rational for somewhat rational creatures like ourselves then to resort to another kind of system. Yeah, we, would have, we would have nothing to lose. Um, he, um, he made some dreadfully disparaging remarks about so-called third world uh, countries full of Eurocentric arrogance and ethnic supremacism at the same time as he made some extraordinary specific remarks, not least about India, but about that part of the world. Um, the theory, the doctrine I spoke of at the beginning that I think is peculiar to Marx, I don't, I don't know anybody else who it, is a banal thing. Out of the kindness of my heart, turn down all those fees that you were going to give me. You know, yeah. um, it's, of course, doctrine. It's not the doctrine about the modes of production. 
It's a doctrine about how you get from one mode of production to another. Right? It's a doctrine, what is specific to Marxist thought, I think, is the conflict between the forces and the relations of production, which he sees as the mechanism of change from one mode of production to another. And that's a very interesting, and in some ways, I think quite a plausible idea, but it's also full of problems. It's full of problems, <coughs> some of which he recognized, and he also talks in different ways about that at different times. Okay. Um, he, um, he seems to have thought at one point that Germany, his own nation, Germany, would have to go through a capitalist phase, a phase of industrial capitalism, to get to socialism. He doesn't it changes the views on this, but that raises a momentous question, uh, which which is this. Uh, I, sorry, I have no real time to develop it, but um, <coughs> Marx seems to believe that in order to have socialism, you have to have capitalism, or if you don't, somebody has to. Somebody has had to be around developing the productive forces, and will come to your assistance, as the Bolsheviks famously hoped. The, the Germans and others would. Now that is, um, uh, on the one hand, an extremely plausible and realistic idea, because Marx already sees that if you don't have accumulated wealth, accumulated institutions, and sophisticated practices, you're going to have, not, well, we would say Stalinism, <coughs> doesn't have the word, but he, you know, he, he, what, he, he has a kind of concept. He talks about, he says, well, actually, he says, you'll, you'll, you'll have the same old crack not quite as you know, polished and sophisticated concept of um, um, or what he scathingly refers to at some point as generalized scarcity. A good, a good definition of stuff, isn't it? Um, but that raises all kinds of moral political but also moral problems. Um, are you saying that the does that say that the wretchedness and suffering that capitalism has generated is somehow justified? In the end, by its leading to socialism. And of course, if one does say that, one's on very dangerous grounds. Yeah. Uh, it perhaps doesn't follow that you have to say things like that. Um, and Mark, it's not clear what Marx himself thought about that. But let me just end by saying this: that um, uh, it, it seems to me, I don't actually know of anybody else who talks about this. Which doesn't mean to say that this is necessarily very valid, it's just it's a fact, I don't. I don't um, it seems to me that a Marxist could quite feasibly say that, um, all right, in the end, this nightmare of history or prehistory, which Marx describes, has a beneficial outcome in socialism. No guarantees. We might be cloned to bits, we might end up with fascism. Yeah. But it, uh, isn't it feasible? that you could have a kind of socialism and say, so what? That doesn't justify the horror that has been in prehistory. It's a completely abstract and academic question because we've had that history and we're in the middle of it yet. But you could take the view of Marx's contemporary and compatriot Arthur Schopenhauer, the gloomiest philosopher who ever said anything. <laughs> so gloomy, he's hilarious and funny. There's something very funny about unremitting gloom. I don't know why. You know, you know, a good kind of comedy line out of it. Schopenhauer totally believed that. He thought anybody who was mad enough to believe that you could ever produce a future that would retrospectively justify the horrors of the past and the present was living in a completely different world. Because Schopenhauer just thought the whole thing had been a dreadful mistake. You know, God had been looking the other way or over the other, and somebody just should have blown the whistle on the sorry <coughs> enterprise and called it off. And you know, if they had me, I wouldn't be here talking to you about it. <coughs> um, as I say, an abstract question to be sure. I mean we are, you know, nobody nobody ever did call it off, even if they should have done. But it's a but it's it's a mind warpingly chilling question, isn't it? A, a, a question that would certainly have seized the imagination of Walter Benjamin, namely, all right, so some people get pulled through the tracks and the tunnels to a good end. What about those who died in the sidings? 
What about those who, who perished in the tunnels? What about those who had no hope of getting through? What about those who were condemned to the wretched hovels of class society in human history? Yeah? Benjamin sees that socialism is a transient creed. He doesn't mean by that gloomy or desperate or without hope in the end, but he means it's tragic in the sense that tragedy, best conceptualized, I think, means not that you come to a sticky end necessarily, though sometimes you do, but you have to be hauled through hell to get to any decent outcome. And it's not beyond question that just as Dostoevsky's Grand Inquisitor hands in his ticket to heaven, you know, because of the suffering of a single child, mm -hmm. it's not out of the question, it's not mad, is it, to raise that question and say, could any future that we could create in any reasonable sense redeem what Marx calls the nightmare of this? Thank you very much. Um, we are now going to hand over for uh, questions and comments and discussion, and then um, Terry is going to sum up at the end. Lovely. So, uh, as people are already doing, um, please raise your hand, and then I will call people in turn. Because I know that lots of people are going to want to speak, I am going to have to um, ask you to restrict your contributions to at the very most three minutes, and to kind of let you know where you are in that process. I will tap on the table after two, and if you keep it as concise as possible, I'd be very, very grateful. So. Um, we're going to start with you, please, and then you. Some excited reader wrote to me from the outside of Australia saying, why didn't you call it Why Marx Is Right? <laughs> so I wrote back saying, um, he's dead. Hughes <laughs> 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 you, travelled slowly, you know. Sorry, you said something. Um, no, I, I, I chose the title, I chose the title, though my, one of my greatest critics, my 16-year-old son, pointed out that it's not really the right title for the book, because the book is actually um, really about mistaken ideas of Marx, so it were demystified. Yeah, but it doesn't do it. And no, and no I, I wasn't really writing for the converting. I don't, I, well, like, I think like a lot of writers, I don't actually set out with any very clear audience in mind. Um, I don't really trust writers. Um, as opposed to propagandists, which I regard as an honourable task, writers who always know why they're writing and who they're writing for. I never know that. There's never a clear-cut mode of decision. I write a book and then I think it's about, you know, Stalinism. Ten years later, looking back, I can see it was about my mother. Really. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, there's a certain, you know, a write, a writing isn't such a self, um, a sort of transparent, yeah, but but I know. But I, you, you point very good. I wasn't writing for the I was hoping not. I was hoping to seize a moment, an opportunity, a, a particular momentous political point, and and you know, did just as it were, try to undo some of the savage travesty remarks that has been so notable. Um, the question about writing a book on love. I actually, uh, who, sorry, but, uh, oh, yourself here. Yeah. I actually, I can find that so far to my letters. I'm a brilliant writer of love letters. If anybody wishes to receive, <laughs> there's a list at the back of the hall. You can just write your name down, you know, and you'll get a sample for you. And if you decide to go ahead with more, I'd be delighted to do that. Um, but it is, uh, it is an important thing that, I mean, love is one of those words, isn't it, that's been so debased, romanticized, sentimentalized, abused, that it's very hard to use it. Um, the, one of the great uh, de defects, almost you might say catastrophes, of the Western bourgeois humanist tradition is that the word love has been almost entirely res reserved for the erotic or the romantic. No, by any, any estimate, you know, the, rom the erotic and the romantic are extremely important. As anybody who receives my love letters will be extremely <laughs> aware. But what gets lost there is, as it were, what I called political love, uh, which is a fairly relative, recent concept, but the, it, the, but the progenitor of which, the precursor, which of course, is of course the, for example, 
the New Testament concept of caritas or agape, you know, which has, which is much less personal. I mean, uh, for a document like the Gospel of St. John, which is all about love, what's very striking is just how utterly unlovely this kind of love is. It's the kind of love that gets you killed. Um, nothing lovely, nothing sentimental, nothing even personal about it. You don't have to feel all weak at the knees about the person that you're trying to help. Yeah. Um, and so there is a tradition in the West which is which transcends the limits of erotic and romantic love, while not rejecting them, yeah, which I think we lose at our peril. And in a certain sense, Marxism was an attempt to revive it, though it's not commonly seen as such. Um, is the human beings as historical agency peculiar to Marx? I don't actually think so. I don't think it matters a great deal that it isn't. Um, it might, because it's mightily important, of course. Um, but the idea that human beings are self-determining creatures within certain limits, um, the idea of self-determination is that the modern age is the age that identifies the idea of freedom with the idea of self-determination. There are ancient parallels of that, so that freedom isn't just do your own thinkism, you know, negative freedom, freedom from constraint, it's a more positive conception of it. Um, if you want to say where in the modern age did the concept of mass politics come from? Uh, a politics that swept Europe, the, the masses as an agent of historical change, wasn't actually Marx, it was Daniel O'Connell. Daniel O'Connell, the great liberator in Ireland, um, invented the concept of mass politics as we now know it in Europe. And I don't just say this because you know I am myself Irish, because we're all Irish in the eyes of God. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, but Marx, you know, there's then many, many people. Think, but the idea that we create our own history, of course, which we now, in a sense, accept, is a extraordinarily radical notion at the time. You know, in the 18th century Enlightenment, the idea that individuals were able to determine their own destiny, as against providence or mythology, or, <coughs> was, was a sort of deeply, deeply revolutionary notion. We must retain the revolutionary charge in that. Um, <coughs> Marx as writer, um, yourself, your, your own point, yes indeed, I mean, he, Marx was acutely conscious of himself as a writer, that is to say, as somebody who wasn't just writing in a kind of instrumental way, just using writing, that's, that's part of the bourgeois utilitarian view of writing or of art or of practice, you know, that there had to be some, some value in, in, in the writing itself, yeah. Um, the, the, the reduction of writing to a purely instrumentalist medium is part of a, a whole late bourgeois catastrophe that happens and that afflicts my mind. You know? Hamlet's last words are, absent thee from felicity a while, and in this harsh world draw thy breath in pain to tell my story, the rest of the silence. Steve Jobs' last words were, oh wow, oh wow. Oh. <laughs> Don't you feel something's been lost? <laughs> <laughs> and this is the great communicator. You know, this is, this is the guy who, you know, um, Marx talked. Marx talked about his own work as forming an artistic whole. I'm not sure it did, actually, but it was interesting that he thought that way. He thought about his own work aesthetically. And, of course, he wanted to get rid of what he called writing on all this economic crap. It might sound better in German, I don't know. <laughs> and get back, you know, to writing about. He was a great humanist in the great European humanist tradition, for whom his style was very important. And you're quite right to say he wrote in a medley of genres. He, he was, and part of that, as with Bertolt Brecht later, was to defeat the stereotype of the German as unable to do that. When Brecht arrived in London with his uh, his ensemble, he said he put in a notice on a notice board in the green room that said the British think that we Germans are slow, sluggish, lethargic bores. I want you to act this with lightning speed. <laughs> <laughs> and Marx, like his great uh, comrade, comrade but co co compatriot Nietzsche, um, knew that you know, there was a certain rather ponderous German style, and he, an academic style, which he wanted. So there's a politics of style in, in Marx uh, in, in, in that sense. The, the, the more, I suppose, the basic question that we keep coming back to the question of um, what do we do in a situation where 
as various comrades have said, you know, Stalinism, uh, the weight of Stalinism has not has not gone away. We can't we can't just undo or wish away that history. Um, well, let's not forget that uh, and, and how are people to be persuaded of socialism? People, of course, are persuaded of socialism, and this is the good point about being a materialist. I suppose they're persuaded of it by material conditions. No amount of academic joying into the small hours fascinating though it may be, you know, is going to move great masses of people. Masses of people are moved by actual ideas. And as soon as politics actually impinges on their everyday daily life, they will move like lightning into political position. Those who, who don't, who are politically apathetic, that is, a, that is a reflection of a comment on the kind of useless politics to which they're normally daily submitted. Who would waste too much energy on that? But come a different situation, arise a different conjuncture, where these ideas make sense in terms of your actual conditions, then of course you would be an idiot not to act upon it. It, it is part of rationality. It is part of rationality to be fearful to act in situations where certain ideas like Stalinism have been discredited, where the future is obscure, where the enemy is enormously powerful. Let's not wish that away in some kind of left triumphalism. They've got more tanks than we have. You know, you know, and in that situation, it is rational to, to be hesitant and tentative about you know, leaping in the dark. You, you've got a lot to lose. What, one thing that ruling classes can't generally ask for is people who have nothing whatsoever to lose. They are very dangerous politically. You know. But the fact is, and, 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 and the downbeat news from that is that as long as, as, as the ruling class can throw people just about enough to keep them going, you know, um, then it's likely, we've given the perils of an alternative, you know, they'll, they'll settle for what they get. And, you know, throwing them among the various things they throw them, let's not forget, is the new opium of people, sport. <laughs> you know, unless we, as you know, leftists, combine to bring down the sporting class. You know, <laughs> We're not going to get very. This is, and this gets me thrown out of so many taxis when I say this. <laughs> <laughs> that dreadful question: Are you here for the game? And I can't resist, you know, giving a little market analysis of bread and services. Um, this, uh, uh, or let, let me just finish by putting that point another way. There's an old slogan that we know of: uh, "Socialism or barbarism." Now that is as relevant as ever, isn't it? Because um, why should people become socialists? Well, no abstract, universal answer that at all. Uh, but uh, should should or might they become socialists when it's clear that the alternative is some kind of fascist barbarism to which the system will doubtless resort if it has to? It's extraordinarily reluctant to do so because if it does so, it discredits itself in the eyes of many people. But if it has to, it will. You know, we've learned that lesson hard enough. And if people are, are, if you're in a situation where that is an imminent reality rather than just a paper reality, I think the question then of people mustering to the socialist standard becomes a much more realistic and a much more. Realistic.